and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Taylor Rockwell. Daryl Grove is not with me today in the office, but instead on the line, I've got MLS Soccer's Sam Stasekel. Uh, it is lovely to have Sam finally on the show. We've uh, run into him on a few different occasions. We've chatted with him on a few different occasions, but we've never had him on air until now. Uh, and I am a little bit uh, annoyed with myself for that reason, because Sam uh, is a great guy and a great guest. Uh, we talked all things Major League Soccer, but really, like, I enjoyed that the beginning of it is focused on the sort of, like, change in business strategy within Major League Soccer, that there's been more there's been more selling of big-name players, which has allowed for more buying. And I think Sam Sam's argument, which I'll let him make and not even really try to paraphrase, is just that it seems like things are changing in the way MLS franchises are doing business, uh, generally for the better. But we also get into some of the big moves that have happened this offseason, some moves that have not happened uh, for a variety of reasons. Then we look at maybe teams that still need to strengthen or teams that might start the season on a bit of a rough patch based on the way their roster build has gone so far. Uh, But we're kind of all over the place. We talk about lots of different teams, lots of different players, lots of different moves, lots of different MLS rules. Um, So lots of good info in there. So I will stop saying lots and instead say, here's my conversation with Sam. With me now on the line, I've got MLS Soccer's Sam Stayskull. Sam, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me about the many MLS things that have happened in the MLS offseason. Of course. Pleasure to be on. Happy to join. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I do want to talk about those moves uh, in the offseason, but first I wanted to hear your thoughts on Greg Berhalter's first two games in charge. Uh, I'm wondering specifically, were you more entertained by the wins over Panama and Costa Rica or uh, the Super Bowl? Because I know you're in Boston now, so I feel like you need to choose wisely <laughs> here. Well, full disclosure, I did not watch the second game. I was in the midst of driving from Chicago to Boston as part of that move. So... I guess I was more entertained by the by the Panama game <laughs> that makes sense. Than, than the Costa Rica one. Uh, and, geez, that and the Super Bowl were probably an equal level of not entertaining, uh-huh. I would say. Both were, both were pretty big duds, I thought. But, really? Uh, right. you know, that's Jan- well, I, I shouldn't call January camp game a dud. It's a January camp game. Mm-hmm. They're playing essentially, and, you know, I know we want to all take positives out of these things because it's been so long, and I know we want to evaluate stuff because we just had a year of – of games that we essentially couldn't really evaluate with the national team. But let's like keep in mind what the competition is here mm-hmm. with these Panama and Costa Rica teams. These are not their A teams. They're not even close to their A teams. Um, you know, some of these guys I've been told got looks, got tryouts with USL teams affiliated with MLS clubs ah. and couldn't even make the USL team. So like that's the level we're looking at here. It's essentially it's it's not even an MLS team comparatively for the most part with these Panama and Costa Rica teams. Um, so while yeah, some of the performances were encouraging, not to rain on everyone's parade, but um, you know I think we need to take everything with a big grain of salt. I, I think um, I think that's fair. And I think I, I think that's especially fair given something you said earlier. You said you drove. To move from did you move from Chicago to Boston? Yeah. So was yeah. that the least pleasant drive I can imagine? Because I feel like that's like polar vortex freezing conditions. <laughs> you you chose to yeah. Move it then. was it was right in the middle of the polar vortex. Yikes! Interesting. Uh, thankfully, it was, there was no snow or anything, so that that made the drive pretty pretty easy. Right. I actually drove from Boston to Chicago randomly like eight years ago by myself in one day. This time I did it in two days, so not quite as bad. But, that, was that just a uh, random yeah, thing? Know. You were like, I really want some yeah, pizza. Yeah, yeah. I was in college. I was visiting a friend in Boston, and I went out with another friend who decided that he wanted to stay a few extra days and book a flight home. So he left me on my own to drive home. So yeah, it was a it was a random thing. But um, yeah, not the worst drive I've ever had. I don't know. I have a lot of weird driving stories for some reason. But hey, there you go. Well, that's good. Well, if ever you you know want to take a an extended trip down ninety five, you're always welcome in Richmond. We'll, we'll we'll put you up. It'll be a good there you time. Go. Um, I but, used to live in Durham, so I used to really? drive through Richmond. Pretty All right. frequently. There yeah, you go. Yeah. There you go. I've been everywhere, man. All hey. over the place. I, I, yeah, it seems that way. It seems like you've been all over the place covering uh, MLS. I did want to ask you then, sticking with the national team one more time, though, maybe two more times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, given how much you've covered the league, how well you know a lot of these players, was there one player that you were like really excited to see get called in, or was there one player that you were excited to see like get some minutes and perform well, or not perform well? Um, so to answer the second part of your question, I, I thought Georgie Mihaljevic looked good from, right. from the first game and the, the highlights I saw in the second. Um, and he's going to have a big role with the fire this year. Mm-hmm. They're really, really high on him. Um, talking to Nelson Rodriguez a few times. Talking to other GMs who have talked to Nelson Rodriguez this winter. Um, they really like Georgie. And he's going to, I think it looks like anyway, 
he's going to have the keys to kind of their attack, um, sort of as a number 10 playing in front of uh, Dax and Cardi and Bastion Schweinsteiger. So he'll have every opportunity to go out there and succeed. Obviously, a young American player, homegrown MLSer. Uh, everyone gets excited about those. Um, and we'll see. He'll have a chance to prove if he has the goods. But he's off to a good start with the national team. I know, uh, I know Berhalter was, was excited by him. Um, so I think that's one that I'm really interested to see how it looks going forward. Um, Nick Lima looks good. I thought Walker Zimmerman looks good in, in what I saw the game that I didn't see. Um, so, but you know, not too surprising from those guys, but yeah, I would say the main headliner for me was Georgie Minowitz. All right. And then one player who definitely did not look very good, uh, because he was involved with the camp and then was sent home was Kellen Acosta. And it feels mm-hmm. like to me, like a strange time for him because he's sent home by the national team coach. And it seems like for both fitness and tactical reasons, but then, or maybe at the same time, his team turns down a fairly big offer from a club in the championship. So I'm wondering like, which of those two things do you think is more indicative of Acosta's current ability that clubs in England are kind of looking at him and thinking that he can be a viable midfield option or, that he's not yet ready to handle Greg Berhalter's system with the national team? Well, I think it's a little bit multifaceted, right? Okay. So the England thing, that, that shows you what, what teams think of his potential, right, mm-hmm. and his ceiling. And in terms of his current form, we can only go by what happened with, with national team camp and where he's at currently, which was getting sent home before the games and going back to Colorado. Um, obviously, the Rapids have a high valuation on him if they weren't willing to move him for $3 million, although, you know, Dallas would get a percentage of that, so... You know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be like Colorado getting a full time mill there, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways this is I don't want to say make or break year for Kellen Acosta because I think no matter what he'll have a nice long MLS career, at the very least. But I think uh, this year is going to be pretty determinative in terms of the trajectory of his career, right? If he's going to go take that next next step, if he's going to go make that jump, mm-hmm. he needs to go prove it with the Rapids this season. So if do you he's think just going to be that guy who has a 10, 12-year MLS career and is a nice player, then you know maybe he'll kind of float along this year. Which of those two things do you think he wants more right now? Because it felt like when he was still with Dallas that he wanted that move to Europe. Now maybe maybe it seems like he would be okay with staying in the league, but maybe that's just me speculating. No, I think he would be good. I think he would be good with staying in I know Colorado want to keep him around too. Obviously, you know they declined that bid, but I, I'm pretty sure they're they're looking to re-sign him to a longer term deal. Um, so, you know, I think it, I think it's interesting. They'll give him the keys, right? Mm-hmm. Like he can be the guy in the midfield there. Um, and so, I think that's an attractive opportunity for him. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's interesting because he's a homegrown kid from Dallas, played with Dallas for so many years. Uh, you know, got that trade last season to Colorado, had the had the half season, and, and now it's kind of like, okay, Kellen, you're here now, right? Mm-hmm. You're in Colorado, and everything that goes along with that from the rapid standpoint, which, as we all know, hasn't been exactly positive over the last couple of seasons. So, can he turn it? Can he help them turn it around? Can he kind of inject some life back into his career, which really is is going on almost two years now since that 2017 Gold Cup where he hasn't really played all that great. Um, so, like I said, it's kind of a turning point. It's an inflection point for him. Can he take that next step? Will he not? I think we'll find out this season. All right. So I feel like I've taken us down like a specific rabbit hole. I want to like back us out a little bit and look at it from a more <laughs> general perspective for a moment because Acosta, sure. uh, l- likely not on the move or won't be on the move uh, in, like, in the offseason. Many other players have left MLS, uh, some for very large fees. That money has come in now that money seems like it's being spent. Has this been one of the more like dramatic uh, offseason periods that you've covered in the league? I think so. Certainly it's been the most dramatic in terms of players exiting in the league. I don't think that's any any surprise. I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying that at all. But um, no, I think it's interesting. And it, and it feels like we, I, I think I just said inflection point or turning point, but it feels like we have one of these every off season or two where it's like, okay, the league's heading in a new new path, a new direction. And it's really kind of increased momentum in a certain way. And I think this winner is the winner that, you know, we'll look back and say, this is when MLS kind of really integrated itself into the global transfer market and really became a serious selling league, right? Obviously you have all new run, you have Davies, you have Tyler Adams, you have that whole Lucho Acosta bananas, PSG, yeah. will he, won't he, he did not thing, which I have so many thoughts and questions about. Um, but, you know, that's, that's part of it. And so MLS is in this market now. And I think one of the really, really interesting things is, is through that Acosta lens, right? Because weird stuff like that happens in Europe all the time, mm-hmm. right? So you have these longtime MLS executive, executives, guys that have been GMs in the league 
for a decade or more, or, or you know, even five, five to eight years, whatever it is, right? They've been pretty much insulated from that, right? MLS hasn't operated in that market for the most part. There's been a few sales here and there, but, you know, it's not like a really regular thing. And then you go down the path with something like Acosta and PSG and the reports coming from both sides of the Atlantic that he's going to be sold and then the last minute snags, so on and so forth. That kind of stuff's regular in Europe. And now MLS GMs, um, they're going to have to kind of integrate into that world. And so I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see which teams do a good, a good job of that and which teams aren't able to handle that. Because I think that's going to be huge, not only in terms of what kind of fees you can get for players, but in terms of keeping players happy, being able to sell a vision to players you're recruiting. And this is really important too, being able to, to get some money back for your owner who might be shelling out millions of dollars in transfer fees and expecting a return on that investment when they buy players. So I think there's a lot of factors that are really interesting there. Um, but yeah, I think this off season is, is one that we're going to look back on and say, okay, this is the winner that MLS really fully became a part of not just the buying players market, but the selling players market. And the implications for the league um, are massive. And from a very like broad standpoint, uh, which teams, in your opinion, do you think are or like will be most likely to be uh, the most adept at doing that integration? And which teams do you think might struggle with integrating into sort of that European madness? Well, I mean, the two that sort of stand out, right, are Red Bull and, and New York City, mm-hmm. just because of the infrastructure that they have with their parent organizations, right? So Red Bull has Red Bull Global, and there are two European teams involved with that. And City obviously has City Football Group. So they already have that infrastructure in place. So the Claudio Arena and Dennis Hamlet can, can lean on uh, the guys in Europe who live in that market every single day, right? So, so those two clubs should be able to do this relatively simply, I, should, I would say. Um, it's going to be harder for teams that don't have that infrastructure um, but at the same time, you know, and, and that's where it comes down to a lot of, I think, individual executive talent, which I think is, in my opinion, a really big thing in MLS, you know, when you, where you're working with a finite amount of resources. Everyone likes to point to money and saying, oh, the big spenders, they're going to win, right? And in a lot of ways, that's true. But in my mind, it's money plus executive talent. And that's kind of what, what the ceiling is, the, the equation there, that, the sum of that equation is that's how good your club's going to be. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think the teams with the good executives, right. You know, you have, uh, Tim Bezmchenko now in Columbus, Garth Lagerway in Seattle, Toronto. have obviously had a good run, although they're integrating a new guy in Ollie Curtis, although he's had plenty of success in his past, you know, teams like that, Peter Vermes in Kansas city, who's, who's made some solid, solid trades and sales in his, um, dealings in KC. Um, you know, teams like that, I would expect to integrate. Well, for me, the most interesting ones are the teams like, uh, Vancouver, right? They go out and sell Alfonso Davies. It doesn't really look like they're going to go and spend that money big time in the transfer market. Maybe they'll surprise us here. Um, but that's obviously a huge one. And then another one that I'm really, really interested by is Houston, um, okay. which sounds weird. Yeah, um, and it's not a an name I thought you were going to throw A little bit of a dark horse. Yeah, but like, you know, they have two players in Mauro Minotas and Albert Ellis who attracted interest from Europe this winter, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're a lower spending team. And so I think they're going to be a really interesting case study because, all right, if you're a lower spending team, you're probably going to have some pressure from your owner to sell those guys if you get a good offer for them, right? And so when you're the GM, in this case, Matt Jordan, you have to make that decision. Okay, is now the right time to sell? Or should I hold on to these guys for a year? And, you know, if I can sell them for four this winter and they have another season where Ellis has 12 goals and nine assists and Minotas has 20 goals, can I then sell them for eight to ten, right? And and how how does how does the how do the other sales in MLS how does Almi run for twenty seven kind of help set that market right? And when's the right time to do it? Because these types of decisions, right? You can afford almost to miss a little bit if you're a Toronto or if you're in New York City or an LAFC, right? If you're a Houston or a Vancouver for that matter, you need to get every cent out of this that you can, um, because that would be a huge huge revenue driver for your club. Um, that not only you could put back into the transfer market, but you could use to uh, boost out your infrastructure in terms of the academy, in terms of your scouting staff, all these little important things um, that maybe we don't necessarily think about right away, but that are so crucial for the long-term health of an organization. So then it sounds like like you would say then that maybe this, like 
micro era or specific time period will be looked back upon as like the time when uh, owners, GMs, what have you, chose to like embrace the kind of selling model and like figure out how to operate within it versus the clubs that didn't and maybe the kind of divide that then develops as a result? Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate, right. and I think it's going to be interesting to see. Um, that doesn't quite because, fit as know, well it, as like 1.0 or 2.0, but I'll take it. That's fine. Yeah, no, it's 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 weird, right? Because now I think MLS has grown to the point where you can't just put every team into one box or even two boxes, right? MLS has grown to the point now where teams converge in different directions and construct different models for how to build a roster and how to build their club out, and they can be successful in each of those models, right? So I think we've kind of grown to that point where the, the ecosystem, so to speak, is pretty vibrant. Um, and I'm really interested to see. But those small clubs in particular, um, or at least the traditional lower spending clubs, that sort of thing is going to be really, really important for them. Because if you're in Atlanta, right, we were like all the talk this winter, oh, maybe they'll hold on to Almiron and loan Barca, right? The, the return on investment, it matters, but it doesn't matter quite as much. Right, so so that marginal that marginal return, I guess, mm-hmm. um, is going to be bigger for those lower spending teams. So so they're going to have to be really good at navigating that transfer market, and they don't have the infrastructure or staff in place most of the time to do so. So that'll be really interesting. Much more MLS conversation from my chat with Sam still to come. But first, I wanted to let you know that today's episode of the Total Soccer Show is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook eat and enjoy. That is very much appreciated. Uh, Again, those plans are very easy to follow. They're fresh pre-measured ingredients and easy to follow six-step pictured recipe cards. And that is key because you can see kind of what needs to be added and when and what it should look like. And uh, hopefully at the end of the cooking process, yours looks vaguely, if not clearly like the uh, the final product in the picture. Um, but it's been a really good service for my wife and I because we've got very busy schedules. She's in school. She's also working. She does nonprofit stuff because she has energy times a million. Uh, I am somewhat busy, not quite that much, but uh, it can be hard to like find time together. But you can basically schedule it out so that you can like be in the kitchen together, making dinner, having conversations. You sit down, you eat the dinner, you both cook together. It's a fun time. If you're not in a relationship, but you maybe want to impress that uh, that certain someone, then HelloFresh, also a good alternative there because it looks like you enjoy cooking and know what you're doing because it ends up with a nice final product. But, you know, it's also a little bit fancy, pre-measured ingredients, different stuff that you might not otherwise uh, be cooking. So you can kind of show off those skills as well. So if you want to impress or you want to, you know, show off your skills a little bit, have some fun in the kitchen uh, and end up with a quality meal, you can take advantage of HelloFresh's special offer for 2019. Get $80 off your first month by going to Hello fresh.com slash tss80 and enter the promo code tss80 at checkout uh so that's hellofresh.com slash tss80 and enter the promo code tss80 at checkout as always a link is in the show notes um so that's basically like receiving eight meals for free or getting twenty dollars off your first four boxes either way it's a solid deal so check out hellofresh at your leisure but probably do so sooner rather than later so thank you to hellofresh for sponsoring today's episode now back to mls and sam one thing that i thought i think you were tweeting about this that i think is like particularly interesting within all of this is the idea that maybe mls like having the seasonal structure that it does and the off season period that it does almost helps them because i i, I, I yeah i think it was you because i agree with your idea that like yeah. um like if you're looking if you are a lower tier premier league club in january you know that if you go looking for talent in europe that you're going to be paying a little bit more because it's that january window and players just are more expensive but you know, teams don't want to sell them as much. Whereas if you turn towards Major League Soccer, those teams uh, have a couple more months to prepare for the start of their season and they can kind of replace players. And so it becomes like a cheaper and maybe more effective alternative. And I'm wondering if that's something that you think will continue to sort of help MLS develop that I- identity as a selling league. Well, I think that's very much to be determined. But Excuse me. I think it's something that could end up happening, right? Mm-hmm. And I think if you're MLS and your MLS teams, that's how you sort of want to position yourself, right? You want to say, hey, like it's going to be tough for you to get a guy out of a European team in the January window because there's not a lot of time to replace that player. That team might need that player for a relegation battle or a fight for a European spot, whatever, right? Um, whereas you can come to us. We're more willing to sell for all the reasons that you just mentioned. 
Um, and we, and, and, and if you're MLS, I think you want to kind of position yourself as, Hey, we are the destination for your January transfers. Right. And obviously there's still a long way to go to, to kind of get to that point where teams are looking to MLS players for that sort of thing. There just, there isn't the critical mass yet uh, of guys that, that are kind of capable of coming in and making that difference. Um, but that could be, that could be something that, that could play a role in the future. Um, one of the few benefits of the unique calendar that MLS is on. But there are a few detract, detracting points as well, right? You know, you look at a guy like Almiron, record feet for the league. <clears throat> Excuse me again, got frog in my throat here. Record feet for the league, record feet for Newcastle, I believe. And it's going to take him a little while to get up to speed, right? Whereas if you buy a guy from Europe, maybe pay a few million more, he can come in right away. He's match fit. True. He's ready yeah. to rock. Whereas a guy like Almiron, you know, he might need a week or two just to get his fitness. Um, and, and, and if you're a Newcastle and you're fighting to avoid going down to the championship, you can't really afford that. Right. So there's a bunch of things that go into that equation, yeah. but I think that's something that I would emphasize if I'm, uh, Darren Eels, right. Or yeah. even Don Garber, right. Like, so that's, yeah, I think it's an interesting factor. Man, I, I hadn't I had not thought about the fitness aspect. All right, so nuance everywhere. Um, one one mm-hmm. that was kind of uh, mind blowing and confusing. I talked to Sebastian Salazar about a little a little bit about it last week. Was the Lucho Acosta uh, deal that wasn't? Uh, since since you mentioned it there, I wanted to talk with you for a moment about that <laughs> because I was like really confused in a variety of ways and like excited, but yeah. sort of like oh, this might not be the best idea. And strangely, I've come around to the idea that like this may ha- this may end up being like the best possible result because I know I guess the scenario was that he was going to go in be like a two month potential Neymar replacement and then who knows what happens right. after that and so instead it feels like I know he's probably disappointed to you know not be playing in the Champions League like against Manchester United but it still ends up being the case <laughs> that now like people know him and maybe know him his name a little bit more yeah. and yeah. now he gets his yeah. name out the league gets their reputation out a little bit more but he doesn't end yeah. up playing for two months and then doing nothing. Yeah, so I have so many thoughts and questions about that. Like let's, I mentioned. let's do you know, it then. The, fir- the first thing that jumped off my mind when I saw that first report by Steve Goff, I think it was, um, was just like, wait a minute, Paris Saint-Germain, they want Lucho Acosta? Like, really? Yeah. Like, this is this is real? Um, which, no disrespect to Lucho, great player. Obviously, we all saw what he did in the second half of last season. But he had two and a half years before that where he wasn't like, I mean, I think it's fair to say he wasn't PSG level, yeah. right? To put it to put it mildly, um, so so first off, that jumps off the page right away, right? As like this is bizarre. Um, secondly, right, um, there was some Middle Eastern interest in, in Acosta, as has been as has been reported, and there were offers from Saudi Arabia for DC United to transfer, right? So my question is, okay, where are the teams in between? You have Saudi Arabian teams coming for him, and then you have PSG. Where's Crystal Palace, right? Where's like Rene? Where's like you know, where's your mm-hmm. random La Liga team? Where's where's that middle class? There's always right? that's kind of yeah. bizarre. Like, and, and maybe there were teams interested that we just don't know about yet. Um, but so, like, there's there's another question for you. And then the other thing is, DC United turning down whatever the I, I know a bunch of figures were thrown around, but eleven and a half or nine or ten or whatever, however many million dollars they reportedly turned down for Acosta. That sounds enough to me too. Like, are DC really going to turn down that money for Lucho Acosta? That, like, I know Almiron just went for 27, but, like, are, do, you, do we really think Acosta's going to get to that level? Like, I don't think so. If, if Paris comes calling um, and, and they want the guy and they offer 10, I'm like, okay, let's, let's find a way to get this done. Now, and then the, the other part of it, right? If you're 2 million apart with Paris Saint-Germain, like, are they really not just going to meet you in the middle? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's they print money. Like, money, like $10 million to them is like a science experiment. You know, what's the difference, right? So there's so many, like, incredible things going on here. But in the end, I think, and you hit on this perfectly, right? This is kind of good for Acosta, um, certainly, and for DC United. Because now you have all this publicity, um, both in France and Europe and here in the States, that this was a Paris Saint Germain, not just target, but like this was a guy that Paris Saint Germain wanted. So what does that do? Every other club in Europe, oh, that's a PSG target. Like, what's he all about? Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at him, right? And when those numbers get thrown around, guess what happens? When it's a PSG target, his price probably goes up, just like automatically, right? There's that little bit of inflation there because you have one of the richest clubs in the world looking at your player. Like, so 
it's good exposure there. Um, it's really interesting, right? So like him coming back that probably if DC are going to resign him, he's in the last year of his deal, that probably adds a million, right? Onto his contract negotiations, right? And if they're not going to resign him or if they can't agree to a new deal, well, Acosta just got a whole bunch of publicity and a whole bunch of attention and a whole bunch of future uh, consideration. If he wants to sign a pre-contract in the summer or move on a free next January. That, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of interesting things there, and I think the winner, in the end, is, uh, is Acosta and his agent, even though the move didn't go through. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think maybe DC a little bit, and I feel like maybe there's a chance that they sort of... DC a little bit, if... If they can resign it. True, very true. Good good call. I just I, I keep finding myself wondering if it was DC United sort of looking around and realizing like, oh, we are like we know how we do business. We're not gonna be able to sign a replacement fast enough. Like, ah, uh, you know, we want eight million dollars more than we said already. Because like that that's the only <laughs> way we can guarantee that we're gonna keep him or at least get yeah. a bunch of money and, out of it. And I'm I'm guessing there was probably some I mean, this is pure speculation, but there might have been some pressure from the league too, to you know, after that Almiron fee came in uh, to, to for DC to go higher, right? So, you know, because the league's involved in all these deals as well. So it's, uh, it's a whole bunch of interesting factors. I would love to know the whole story. Hopefully we get it one day. I mean, I think that should be uh, your work for the entire season. Just forego all of your coverage right, of other clubs go. and breaking news. Just focus yeah, on the one let, Acosta deal that didn't happen. I will let my, uh, I will let my boss know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, since, <laughs> since uh, you mentioned, like, the potential of MLS uh, HQ getting involved there. Uh, that obviously did happen this week with uh, Andrew Gutman and like Celtic, Chicago, Nashville, all the different or, uh, organizations involved. People For people who weren't uh, paying attention to that one or didn't kind of see that, what happened there and what were your thoughts on the way it all went down? Yeah, so I don't really know much about the background of what mm-hmm. happened. I think I know about as much as you do um, and everybody else does in terms of the actual deal there but you know just to recap it for anyone that's not familiar uh andrew gutman was indiana university won the matt Herman trophy given to the best player in college soccer uh the fire offered him a contract uh he chose to go to scotland he had a trial with rangers ended up signing with celtic um from what i was told he was probably gonna have issues getting a work permit so celtic were looking to loan him out uh, they loaned him to nashville and then um according to a statement that nashville put out there you know, I believe, and help me if I'm wrong here, because they're an MLS expansion team next season and yeah. the fire holds his MLS rights, the league was like, hey, you can't do this, essentially. Um, I mean, I don't love it. <laughs> it's bizarre, but it's kind of falls in line a little bit with past protocol, right? Um, in terms of what, what teams are doing with what, what happened with Cincinnati last mm-hmm. season, right? Where they're able to trade allocation money for Fernando Adi and for Taya Lache, uh before they enter the league. And then there's the whole Fabian Johnson thing where they weren't able to sign him to a USL contract, which would then turn into an MLS deal because, you know, they weren't able to use the allocation order spot on him because they didn't have one because they weren't in the league yet. So basically the league has been treating these expansion teams or future expansion teams, I guess, I guess I should say um, sort of within the rules of MLS um, over the past year or so. So it's not a huge surprise that this might have happened. Um, I guess the interesting thing for me is could Nashville have, you know, acquired his MLS rights from Chicago? And if that happened, then could they have, could the loan have gone through? Um, so, you know, a lot of factors. Uh, obviously, uh, a bit of a messy situation and an unfortunate one for the player, right? Who's now going to kind of go and play with Celtics development team and as they kind of look to loan him out elsewhere. Um, so we'll see. I mean, hopefully, hopefully it works out for for the kid because you know you don't want to see a a career start in such a turbulent fashion, really. Uh, yeah, no, that's not ideal. But uh, first off, I, w- I yeah. want to say, uh, how dare you? Because you said like, oh, we pretty much know the exact same amount about this situation, and then you proceeded to give a like <laughs> detailed bullet point explanation of everything that had happened. <laughs> so let's just assume, Sam, that you you are uh, at least slightly to very slightly more knowledgeable well, when it comes public, to these things. Right? That was public, <laughs> oh, I know. 
know. I was just saying, mine was like, oh, you know, Celtic, he went, he didn't. But now, I don't know, Sam, thoughts? And then it was like very specific. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting there is like something that I feel like you and Paul Tenorio and a lot of other people who are very like steeped in MLS legalese almost have to deal with is similar to like my wife who is uh, finishing up law school. Like we'll have disagreements about, about various things and hers – like and it usually stems from the idea that like she is so versed in like the legality of stuff that she'll be like, well, that's how yeah. they ha-. like when I'll be like, oh, that's such a stupid thing to say in a commercial, and she'll be like, well, technically that's how they had to do it because if they do it this way, then that's <laughs> violating. And it's just like, yeah, all right, so you know stuff. And it's interesting to hear you yeah. talk about it from a like I've heard a lot of uh, like, emotional reactions to the Gutman thing, and to hear it from a like, well, this is the kind of way they've established it. It's interesting to hear somebody who's kind of versed in the nuances of MLS explain a deal like that. Because it's a good reminder that like MLS can be really difficult to, to kind of understand and understand how it all operates. But if you get that understanding down, it makes moves that happen or don't happen that much more like apparent or easy to understand. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate yeah. the kind of like uh, straightforward appraisal of that situation. So, so thanks for that, Sam. Yeah. Well done. Hopefully, I got it right, and I didn't mess anything up there. Well, but, yeah. You know, uh, if you I'm did, sure, then I'm sure I'll hear about it. If I did, yeah, I was gonna say you'll um, hear about it and disregard everything I just said <laughs> if you got it wrong. Never mind. Then. <laughs> but thank you. That was very nice. Of course, of course, my pleasure. Um, <laughs> a, a couple other like specific teams I wanted to talk about. Uh, one that you've already mentioned was NYCFC. Uh, they've had an interesting uh, transfer window that paid 8.5 million dollars, or at least that's what I believe uh, a certain someone reported uh, for Alexandru Mitrita. Uh, that. I think it was the among the highest fees paid in MLS history. He's not quite a household yeah. name. So what did you make of that move? Well, to be fair, it wasn't like Miguel Almiron was a household name before he arrived in Atlanta. Also right? true. So, you know, um, I wouldn't go too much on that front. But, yeah, that's a ton of money. I believe, and I could be wrong, it's the third or fourth highest transfer fee in league history for a player that's coming out of the Romanian league, which is just, bizarre Mm -hmm. um you know typically that's not really a huge market i think it's the third highest fee ever in that league's history um for a player exiting romania um so it's really kind of interesting the reaction i got from from executives from other teams yesterday was like wow that's that's a lot you know like i've seen this kid and he appears to be pretty good but i don't know if i would have paid that much money for him that being said like we were talking about earlier you know, with everything with NYCFC, you have to kind of view through the lens of the city football group with these types of deals. And so, you know, there were European teams after Matrita reportedly. And if city football group are high on him and maybe they have some plans for him, then, you know, eight and a half million for them, that's a lot for MLS. But for them, for CFG, not that much, mm-hmm. right? So it'll be really interesting. But I think this is going to be a very, very interesting season uh, for NYCFC. You know, Dome Torrent. Obviously, things didn't really go smoothly for him last year after uh, he took over after Patrick Vieira left. And, uh, you know, they've lost David Villa. They've lost Young Hal Herrera, uh, two of the best players. And, you know, they replaced him with a relative unknown who's coming from Romania for a lot of money. And with, like, Keaton Parks, who, you know, was never really able to break through with, with Benfica in Portugal. So a lot of questions with NYCFC. Um, I don't really know where they're heading right now, uh, but I think it's fair to wonder uh, where exactly they're going to fall. And I don't really see them among the top teams in the East, at least at this point, um, next season. So lots of question marks around NYCFC. I've got another one for you. Uh, That question mark would be Jonathan Lewis. He's one that I think is on a lot more people's radar after his performances with the U.S. national team uh, in the January camp. But it sounds like he might not be in line for consistent minutes again this season. Why has that been the case, uh, like, to your understanding? And why might it still be the case in 2019? Is it a case that it's just NYCFC are in such a state of flux that they can't really guarantee minutes to a young player? Well, I mean, you can't guarantee minutes to anyone True. regardless of who you are, right? So every player has to go out and earn it. And I think this is a big frustration for me, actually, when it comes to our discussion around young players. is Oh, these teams need to give them a chance. Well, we're not there in training every day. We're not there, you know, seeing how this kid is competing and whether or not he's got the quality, really, to go out and earn those minutes. Um, I know, obviously, you know, you want to give the kid a chance eventually just to see what you what you have, Right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I, I digress with, with Lewis specifically, from what I understand, just Delmay Torrent is not his biggest fan at mm. the moment. So, 
you know, that's that's kind of where it is. It's a, it's a situation we see with players all over the world where a coach comes in, a new coach, the one that did not bring them in, and just doesn't like them that much. Uh, Lewis is a really young kid still. Um, I know uh, certain members of NYCFC like him a lot. Um, so we'll see, you know. I mean, that team is in flux. So when there is a team in flux, usually that means that there are opportunities, right? There are vacancies and, and there are chances for guys to kind of move up or move down the pecking order. Um, so I would expect Lewis to, to have a shot, right? Um, and we'll see if he's able to uh, to capitalize on that or if he has to go somewhere else, maybe another loan, um, like we saw last year when he went down to Louisville and USL. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. It's Like I said, an interesting one with NYCFC. A lot of question marks and not really a ton of knowledge out there about what their plans are. Hey everybody, Taylor cutting in one more time for the final time today to let you know about today's sponsor, Dollar Shave Club. I am sure you've heard of them, but maybe you don't know of their greatness. You should, uh, because Dollar Shave Club uh, delivers everything you need to your door to get ready for your day, your date, your life, what have you. Uh, they've got you covered from head to toe for your hair, your skin, your face, you name it, they have it. Uh, I genuinely have fallen in love with their toothbrush. Uh, maybe I am just wildly out of date when it comes to toothbrush technology, but it's got this like severe bend to it. That's a wrong way of putting it. It's got a great bend to it that basically makes it so that like as soon as the toothbrush goes into your mouth, it goes right right to the back of your molars. It makes it really easy to get to them so you're not overbrushing, you're not underbrushing. Somehow it's possible to do both at once, but not with this toothbrush, I think, because it is excellent. Uh, they've got the tooth, toothpaste that comes with it, which comes in the, the bright green tube, so you can't lose it, but it's also very nice toothpaste. And really, that's par for the course with Dollar Shave Club. Uh, I've enjoyed all of their shampoo and face washes, their hair care products, uh, their beard care products, also very useful for you know keeping the, keeping the lines, keeping it groomed, not looking like an unfrozen caveman lawyer, which my wife would not appreciate. Uh, right now, Dollar Shave Club have a bunch of starter sets you can try for just five dollars like their oral care kit which features that lovely lovely toothbrush uh, after that the restock box ships regular size products at the regular price so what are you waiting for get your starter set for just five dollars right now at dollarshaveclub.com slash tss that's dollarshaveclub.com slash tss thank you as always to dollar shave club for sponsoring today's episode now here's sam again are there any moves that you have found, either that you think have been particularly good or that you have just found particularly interesting for whatever reason? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously the Toronto stuff is really interesting go. with that right. guys and Javinko leaving, right? Like, those those are two unplanned departures for TSC um, that, you know, welcome to the club, Ali Curtis. Here's your first two weeks on the job. Your two, most, two of your most important, probably your two most important attacking players are now gone. And you need to replace them right away. Um, so have fun with that. Uh, that being said, I expect TFC to go out and spend huge on a replacement for Juvenco. Um I, I think it'll be a high, you know, in the past with, with Bradley and, and Sebastian and Josie, it wasn't necessarily high transfer fees. It was really high salaries for those guys. Um, I think it'll shift a little bit. I still expect them to pay quite a high salary for whoever they're bringing in. But I think they'll go a li- maybe a little bit younger maybe a little bit more on the transfer fee and shift that spend a little. But I, I'm guessing we're probably looking at at least $15 million in terms of transfer fee and total spend over the course of the contract in terms of salary, um, and maybe up to 2025. So this is going to be a huge investment for TFC and one that we could see really quickly. But this is, it. I mean, again, I go back to like inflection points for, for the league and for teams. And for Toronto, this is like as big as it gets, right? You know, because not only is Giovinco, not only are Giovinco and Vasquez gone, but Bradley and Altidore are in the last year of their contracts, and I don't see Toronto bringing them back uh, at anywhere near the salaries they're making currently. Um, so that's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. And uh, Ali Curtis and Bill Manning have huge, huge tasks at hand for this season, not only to get Toronto back to the playoffs and to have them make another run in Champions League, as, as you know they want to do, um, but you know, to plan for the future and to see what TSC is going to be in 2020 and beyond. Um, so really, really interesting there. Wait, uh, sticking, other things, wait, sticking with Toronto yeah. for one sec, uh, two questions there. Yeah. One, um, 
not even I was going to ask sarcastically, but I'll ask straightforward. So then what like <laughs> what do you think Terrence Boyd will do? I know they, they've brought him in, or at least yeah. I think that's official at yeah. this point. I'm assuming he is not it the is. DP they've been talking about. I'm guessing that's like a Tam sign, no, no, no. maybe lower. No, not even Tam. All um, right. So I just put this out on Twitter right before, right before we started the call. So it's like around 200K for 2019, and okay. then it's option years after. So he's not even guaranteed beyond this season. Um, so I like that move a lot. You know, it's low cost. It's, uh, you know, you're not risking much when that's the sort of spend. Um, and he can come in and, you know, he's obviously struggled with injuries in the past, but he has talent and I'm sure he'll be hungry to, to go out and kind of um, boost his name once again. Right. So I think, you know, the idea is for him um, to be kind of competition for Josie. Um, Josie has had obviously a history of, of missing games um, most seasons of his pro career due to injuries uh, and national team duty. Right. So if Josie's gone for the Gold Cup, that's a ready-made backup, um, a ready-made replacement for him. So I think that's an interesting one, kind of a, a low-cost and therefore low-risk um, flyer on a guy that could potentially have a pretty high ceiling. And is, do you think there's a chance that, like, say the season starts off poorly, Josie gets injured again, it's just not clicking. Is there a chance that we see Toronto blow up a little bit and kind of rebuild? Like, could you envision a scenario in which Josie Altador is injured and maybe gets sold or J- Michael Bradley gets sold out? Or do you think it's going to be those two they're going to stick with, off them reduce contracts and sort of try to rebuild with them within the unit? I mean, I don't see them getting sold at this okay. point. You know, if anyone was going to come and buy them, then it would have been in January because if you're if you're a team interested in either of those players in the mm-hmm. summertime, you know, you just wait six months or you sign them to a pre-contract. True. You know what I mean? You're not going to pay Toronto a fee for either of those guys when they're six months from expiring, particularly when they're both making over $5 million. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this year, right. no, one, no one's, no one's going to want to take on those wages <laughs> either. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no one – I don't think anyone's going to – get sold in the summer at least those two are going to get sold in the summer by Toronto but uh could I see it going wrong and blowing up sure yeah um you know they have they're like I said they're down Javinko and Vasquez right they're also down Vanderwaal who was not great last year to be fair and seems like he had some uh, was maybe a locker room issue <laughs> considering yeah. he he left the team for allegedly taking a swing at Greg Vanny yeah so maybe that's addition by subtraction but, uh, <laughs> but you know, like they're remaking the back line. Can Chris Mavingan do more stay healthy? Um, is Michael Bradley, you know, he had a down year last year. Is, is he going to be able to kind of recover this season? And if not, like, what does that look like? Uh, same thing with Marky Delgado. I think he had a down year last season as well. Um, you know, Jonathan Osorio was good. He was probably their best player last season, um, at least relative to expectations. Um so can he continue? There, are, there are just a lot of questions around them, and they still need they still need two attackers at least, maybe three when you include the summer window. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, a lot of questions about Toronto, and if it goes south um, over the first half of the season, if they exit the CCL early and they don't get off to a good start in MLS, yeah, the pressure is going to be super high, and I could see things getting a little tense there. And who who else have you found to be particularly captivating this off season, uh, either for positive reasons or negative reasons? Um, Vancouver, just because they're so unknown, Uh I think, right? We don't know much about any of these plays, if we're being honest, right? Unless you have one of the scouting software programs that costs thousands of dollars. I don't know how you're watching the Korean second division and the (laughs) Tunisian league and so on and so forth, right? So I don't think we know what they're going to look like. I'm interested to see it because Mark Dos Santos has had success in his first year at every single head coaching job he's ever been at. Um, So I'm interested to see what that looks like. Uh, obviously Atlanta, you know, they seem to be slowing down now, but, uh, they were, they were the talk of the town, so to speak, uh, for most of the winter. Um, you know, Chicago are endlessly interesting to me. Um, and maybe that's because it's my hometown. Um, but again, another team that seems to be, uh, falling into the same trap they did last year, where they're just not able to get signings over the line. Um, you know, they still need another center back. They still need outside backs. And if you plug in their first 11, uh, I think it's decent, um, but they have no depth at all. So what happens if any of those guys get hurt or any of them go international? Then you're in trouble pretty quickly. Um, I think Colorado did some interesting things this off season. I don't think they're going to be particularly good this year, but uh, you know they're setting up for 2020 uh, when Tim Howard and Gashi are off the books and they can go out and spend a little money on DPS. Um, I mentioned Houston earlier. Uh, I like their roster. <laughs> Everything went wrong for them last year in terms of injuries, um, and they did not have a good season. But I expect them to bounce back and make the playoffs this year. 
Um, and then kind of a team that hasn't been talked a lot about, I think, this winter is Seattle. Um, and I think they're going to be really good. Really? Um, yeah, I think they're going to be really good. Um, you know, they have Rui Diaz from the jump this year. I think they're just more complete at the start of the season than they have been in past years. You know, they have Jordan Morris coming back um, on a new contract, Roldan on a new contract. Uh, I think Roldan and Svensson in the middle of the, of the center and midfield for them, kind of as a two in that four, two, three, one. I think that's going to be better than, uh, than Ozzy and one of those two guys. I think Roldan's better in that spot than he is on the wing. And then you can put Victor Rodriguez out wide, you got Ladero, you know, Harry Ships come back. So I think they're a really interesting team, and I think they should be good to go from the jump this season, which obviously has been uh, kind of a bugaboo for them in past years. And then uh, in terms of other teams, Orlando. Just, oh, yeah. Like, how much of a train wreck is this going to be? <laughs> you know? Like, not to, not to bag on them too hard, but, like, James O'Connor inherited a tough situation, mm-hmm. but that roster is not good and they don't really have money to go out and sign other players. So that's going to be an interesting one. So all-star um, break in, Atlanta, in Orlando is going to be terrific? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be uh, it's gonna be hot and humid, maybe <laughs> in more ways than one. Um, but, yeah, and then in terms of overall league stuff, um, I think the, the balance of power, you know, we talked about it shifting to the east, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's completely back with the west now. Uh, which I think is interesting. I actually thought the West was better last year than the East, apart from the top teams. Um, and I think the West is a lot deeper. Um, you know, Atlanta is still going to be there at the top, most likely. Um, but even with even with Atlanta, there are a lot of questions about basically every single team in the East. And in the West, you can just pencil in, in my opinion, LAFC and Kansas City and Seattle, uh, Portland. I think the Galaxy will be in the playoffs this season without too much trouble. Uh, and then you got a strong group of contenders behind them. So I think that's that'll be a narrative for this season. Too. This is this is such a weird off season because like. I, it's a strange world to say like, oh, we've been talking about like DC and Houston and Vancouver, and we haven't really focused <laughs> on the Galaxy or LAFC, which is kind of a strange yeah. thing to realize. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm with you on LAFC. Why do you think the Galaxy will be in a better position? Is it just a uh, new manager coming in? Is it Zlatan as a DP? Uh, because last I, mean, I checked, I... Talent. It, they just have too much talent. Okay. Like, and, and, you know, I think they're going to be helped by, you know, we saw them at the end of last season, right? Obviously, everyone remembers that collapse they had on decision day against Dynamo in the second half, rightfully so. But just by virtue of getting Siani and Skelvic out of the lineup at center back and putting Legette and Jonah Dos Santos next to each other and just kind of simplifying things and playing like a 4-4-2 almost, they were so much better at the end of the year. And it was easy fixes. So they still have a really talented roster. They have, um, you know, they, they still have a lot of questions in center back and in net and defensively, but they have so much attacking firepower. And I think just by virtue of having just like even, even if it's just like a little bit below average at center back, I think they'll be fine. I don't think there will be too many issues there. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of my thought with the Galaxy. And I'm I am I, again. It's it's a strange realization that I'm like completely out of the loop on the Galaxy because last I checked, they had four DPS. I believe I'm yeah, saying that that's, that's not funny. as much of an issue anymore. Uh, or is that still is something. is that still the case? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's still the case. All right, I don't know if you want to check Twitter real quick. So <laughs> I basically, crazy. honestly, what I did while we were chatting is I went to Wikipedia because I was like, have they dealt with this? And the only thing I'll say is Wikipedia doesn't list Alessandrini as a DP. So I was like, maybe they've paid him down or something like that. But Wikipedia is also not always the most reliable of sources. But I guess I just, I it seems like that is kind of where the galaxy have been in my mind is like, yeah, they're chaotic, but I'm sure they'll figure out a way to make it work. So I'll just check back yeah. in with them on opening day. So That's think, kind of my approach. I think they have. I think they have two options. Okay. At this point, um, obviously the lot of not going anywhere. I don't think they want. Uh, they definitely don't want Alessandrini to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Anywhere. I saw. You know, they. I saw a picture this morning of a billboard in LA with Alessandrini on it. I don't. They don't want John, Jonathan Dos Santos to go anywhere. We saw him in the second half of last year. Play pretty well. Um, they want to move Geo. I don't think there's much of a market for Geo, as as to no one's surprise. Uh, I think this either ends with him being bought out, um, which, you know, I would put that like 80, 85% chance at this point. And then the other option, because Alessandrini isn't that much above the 1.5 million threshold uh, for a TAM player. 
Um, so what you could do there, if he agrees to it, is say tack on a few years to the end of his deal and lower that average annual um, value to 1.5 or below um, and kind of take care of him for longer guaranteed, um, but buy him down using TAM um, if you get him to that 1.5 number. So I think those are the two options. I think it ends with CEO gone, though. I think that that's that's my hunch. That's kind of the expectation around the league. And and who do you think between you and Tenorio, who do you think is more versed in the like here's how you could solve that problem and I'm gonna break it down so I know exactly <laughs> how to like pay this player down? I don't know. Maybe maybe we should have like MLS Jeopardy between me and Paul and I would like, like, that. We could, like teach like a we could teach like a law school style class, you know, go like Socratic method, right? Put a GM in front and just like have him shout out questions. And I like we can, that. Uh, we can we can try and answer fastest and most correct. I like, or maybe I like, an essay test. I don't know. Yeah, see, that's, there, there I like that idea. I like the idea of them giving you a prompt of like, you're a GM of a, of a team with four designated <laughs> players. Here's your salary, blah, 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 blah. Like, how do you make this work? And you both have an hour to figure it out. I, I, this is a competition I, think, I want. Yeah, no, I think I think Paul is a little bit more thorough than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say I'm, I'm vastly more entertaining than Paul. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where I stand. I appreciate the vastly. That's well done. Uh, well, I, I would agree yeah, that you're. We'll let the listeners be a good judge. Well, I I will agree that you're pretty entertaining, uh, which is why I'm excited to uh, get to listen to your new endeavor, your new podcast. Can you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about uh, yeah. why you decided to start that and what y'all are going to be doing? Yeah. Well. Well. Thank you for for plugging that. Yes, sir. Me, of course. Letting me plug it. Uh, it's called allocation disorder. Um, and it's just kind of what I just talked about. So it's me and David Goss and, and Paul Tenorio is going to be on a lot of the time as well. And we're just kind of, you know, we feel like we have a uh, unique knowledge and a unique perspective um, on a lot of different things. And we just wanted to uh, hear ourselves talk more. So, um, you know, we felt we, we felt we would give ourselves a platform to do that. Um, and, you know, I think tackling issues in the way that we just tackle them. I think this this segment was a pretty good preview of what allocation disorder is from my side of things. And then uh, me and David and Paul uh, yell at each other as well. And I make a lot of dumb jokes. So, you know, that's kind of what it is. But the, the whole idea is to kind of open up um, beyond the games, beyond previews, beyond uh, surface level transactions, and really hone in on three or four topics per show and really get micro and then expand – um, and have those kind of broader macro level um, discussions about what certain moves or certain games or certain whatever mean um, from a league perspective and how they fit into the overall scheme of MLS and American soccer. So that's the idea. It's called Allocation Disorder. Uh, we have one episode out and the other one will be coming soon. So give it a listen along to this great podcast. There we go. Uh, so that's <laughs> Allocation Disorder is how they can hear your words. If people want to read your words, uh, how can they do so? Yeah, uh, MLSsoccer.com. Um, I'm Love sure it. most of your listeners are familiar with that website. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I am. And Twitter, if you want to, uh, if you want some more dumb jokes and occasional insight. And ran and random Boston walkarounds. If they just bump into you, should they just start asking you random questions yeah, about the revolution? Yeah, no. If, if you bu- if you bump into me, please don't talk. To me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, no. If you bump into me, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That would be weird if you did. But like, you know, yeah, say hello, and you know, we'll high five and. Um, you know, maybe I'll race you down the street or something weird like that. I don't know. We'll there, see what happens. There we go. I, I like that you're now obligated to do something zany if and when people run into you on the street. <laughs> so good luck with that. But uh, but Sam, really, I appreciate you taking all the time to uh, keep uh, uh, me and my listeners or our listeners up to date with uh, with all things MLS offseason. Thank you again very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a blast.